everything sounds great. You're saying off camera, it does it sounds like an acoustic guitar. It projects like an acoustic guitar. It does. It's its own sound. It's not like a Strat or a Tele, and it's not like a Les Paul or you know anything else. It's its own sound. So he's going to do really well with these. We're here with my good friend Tim Pierce in the uh, the famous lair. <laughs> I've had this idea for a while. Things pro guitarists do that intermediate or amateur guitarists don't. Well, the thing about guitar is that you have to really devote yourself to it to be good at it, but that can make you a bit self-centered. And the thing to remember when you're collaborating with people is that it's not about you. And sometimes that can really be to the nth degree, to the extreme, because a lot of the parts that I did on songs for people uh, I would create a part that was pretty simple. I'd make it simpler, I'd make it simpler, and it would almost disappear in the track sometimes. So just remember, when you're actually making a song with people, with a singer, in a group, it's not about you. And the problem with that is it has to be about you the rest of the time <laughs> because you're getting good at your instrument and you have to have you know, a fair amount of you know, ego for that. But when you get in the group and you're making a song... It's not about you. Yeah, Dean Parks told me the other day that basically graduated from North Texas, uh, the jazz school, mm -hmm. and he realized, I know exactly how to be a jazz virtuoso, but I want to be a rhythm player. I want to go to LA and do studio work. And he said, that meant I became a drummer on the guitar. You're a drummer when you play rhythm guitar. Yeah. Another thing, gear that you get enamored with or excited about, uh, sometimes it doesn't pan out in a situation. I mean, I'll give you an example. You can buy the sweetest, greatest, coolest guitar, take it into the recording studio. You're with a producer, an engineer, an artist, you put it up and they go, I don't think I like the Squire better. I used to work with this guy, Trevor Horn, and he had access to the most sophisticated, expensive gear in the world, but he had no problem playing a part through a Line 6 pod. Remember mm. those other bean, old bean pods? It's like, because he had completely transcended the idea, the attachment to how you got the sound. And the way I've said it to people, it's uh, the gear is transportation. I don't care what you drove to get here. I just care that you're here. Mm. And whatever that thing is out there that you drove here, it could be really impressive. It could be an Uber. Yeah. But the fact that you got, it's just transportation. Gear is just transportation. The sound is the destination. The sound is all the really, really people who know what they're doing. They want a sound. That sound could be a $5 thing or a $5,000 thing. It's the sound. And yeah. everybody wants to be surprised and delighted by a new sound. That's amazing. Yeah, the gear is just the transportation. Love that. So when I play live, let's say it's in your hometown. You're going to have like 50 people who you know there, right? right. They're all, all going to want to talk to you. Yeah. And so my strategy has always been to have those conversations with my guitar in my hand. So let's say you do the sound check, you have your dinner, people start showing up. Well, if I'm backstage and there's 12 people in the room and I'm talking to all of them, I'm noodling the whole time. Right. Because I wanna know that when I walk out on that stage that I've never been more warmed up in my entire right. life. So I'm just, I'm talking to you going, yeah, yeah, right. Oh, how's she doing? Mm. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, you, you did? Oh, that's really cool. And these fingers are moving constantly. It settles the nerves. And it means that when you walk out there, it's like it's burned in. You're just you're just ready. Right. So are you thinking about anything in particular no, playing wise? You're just mindless. mindless. No, I'm there for you. I'm talking to you, but right. the, the, the hands I'm, are moving. I'm going for it. And I when I used to tour in the 80s with Rick Springfield, we would do a sound check, there would cater dinner, and you're filling that time before the show, and it's a big audience. They shut down all the lights, this crowd screaming, you're standing backstage, nervous. How do you prepare for that moment? My way of preparing was to have the guitar in my hands literally for three hours mm -hmm. before the show, just walk around with it, walk around with it. And then, so you have this, this kind of hedge against nervousness mm -hmm. and those first few moments on stage. And then when you get up there, you go, oh, I can actually play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? Before a gig, Talking to people, socializing, mindless noodling, I recommend highly. Right. So the other thing is, okay, I built this pedal board. I'm going to do the Grammy Awards in about a week. And it's been built and tested repeatedly already. And I'm going to have it sitting here for a few more days. 
really bulletproof test your gear. If you build something, you put together a pedal board, an amp, whatever you've got, test it many, many times before you take it to the gig because it really is Murphy's Law. If there's one little cable that's a little out or one pedal that's problematic, you need to find that early. The other thing I always do, I always bring two of everything to a gig. So there is a spare amp. There is a spare guitar, just in case I break a string. There's a spare speaker. So I'll have two cabinets, two heads. Bring two of everything to the gig. Yep, definitely two guitars. I always, always have two guitars, yeah. at least. Extra cables. Yes. Patch cables. Have a spare of everything. Yeah, it's you really, really it. important. And then I had something else I wanted to talk about. It's like when you have a really, really big client list you're working with. Let's say you have 100 people you work with. When I was super busy doing sessions seven days a week, and yeah. that's not an exaggeration. Maybe there were 100 people I was working with in the course of 90 days or whatever. There were always one or two of those people that were problematic in mm. the sense that maybe they didn't pay you on time. Right. Or everything was an emergency. And so every time they called, it would throw off your week. You'd have to do it at an inconvenient time. And then maybe we, when you got there, they were so stressed out that it made you feel like you couldn't do a good job. Problematic clients. Okay, so if you have two people in your life that are not respecting you or that are just in a constant state of chaos and emergency, those two people can make you have a bad attitude towards the entire other 98 people on the list. I call it poisoning the well. So all of a sudden I show up for my session with you and I, I look at you and I go, what's your problem? <laughs> and it's just you, you're a good guy, yeah. right? But because this other th person that I've been dealing with has poisoned the well, I'm looking at you like you're a bit of an adversary because musicians were programmed to take every gig and earn every dollar, mm -hmm. every cent, yeah. never turn down an opportunity. But if you can give up those people, it's worth it because then what you bring to everybody else is joy. This I heard this quote. Remember Danny Korchmore, the guitar player yeah. who produced the Don Henley records? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, because he would hire, you know, he hired Pino Palladino and Steve Lukather and all the greats to play on Don Henley records, you know. Everybody would come in and play on those records. They asked him, what is the number one quality in a studio musician? And he said, joy. Ah. So protect that. Yeah. Protect your joy. And can you talk a little bit about that, like sort of dealing with not necessarily the ego of, of an artist, but just understanding that they're bringing you their life's work, their most vulnerable work and how important it is to sort of maintain the, the positive vibe in the studio? Yeah, that's a really good subject. So the reason there are very few films or photographs, or very few records of our favorite amazing albums or songs is because when people go into the studio you're going to fall flat on your face trying ideas they're going to fall flat on their face trying ideas it's the most exposed situation in the world and so that's why nobody has taken films of all these great records and nobody's taken photographs and it's also because if if the artist is actually famous if you're taking something away that's really private and it's intimate, you're actually exploiting them. So mm. if you do a selfie, you're kind of like taking a piece of them and using it to push yourself out into the world. It's a very safe environment. So what you need to do is in the first 15 minutes with your body language, with your demeanor, you need to make that person feel safe and mm. comfortable. Like you're never gonna tell a story out of school about what went down, where they missed a note, they choked a note, or they got food on their shirt, or anything, anything of that sort. There's kind of an unwritten rule about that. And if you do that, you will be the person that they call back, that they trust. And it has to happen very, very quickly. It has to mm. happen in the first few minutes. Wow. Well, the easiest thing to do is to say less and just try and give them something musically that, that they can use. Mm. The less you say, the best in the beginning. And always, you know, if you have lunch and everybody starts to talk, then you can talk too, but never. I've walked away from lunch going, I should, probably shouldn't have told all those stories <laughs> to Adele as we were having lunch, you know. <laughs> she didn't need to hear that particular story. <laughs> <laughs>
what it is, what it really is, and this is the crazy thing, you have to present yourself as an equal. Mm. And as an equal, you want nothing from them. You don't need to be there. You're there to collaborate musically. I remember having a, a conversation with Rod Stewart about where he bought his reading glasses. <laughs> and these are the $15 reading glasses that everybody wears. And so it's like, it's those kind of things that make people really comfortable. I remember a conversation with Bruce Springsteen where he talked about how it was <laughs> early days for cell phones and he was riding his Harley and he had a call and he parked his Harley in Beverly Hills and went and sat on somebody's lawn and used his cell phone. He said, that's pretty cool. I can actually, you know, just... It was <laughs> those kinds of conversations are what bond you to the people. You are an equal, you burned the cookies. Mm. They burned the cookies, you know. Yeah. You got stuck in traffic, they got stuck in traffic. Right. All of these things. These Which I, things. I think that can be hard for maybe a less experienced or a younger guitar player who's starting to get some of these opportunities. If you know, I, I remember what it was like my first time getting to work in a studio where it was owned by a person from a band that I really admired being starstruck that I was even in the room. Yeah, I, I probably stuck my foot in my mouth a we few all times do. on that session. We all do. I, I did it once really badly, but I, most of the time I was smart about it. I worked with Phil Collins for a number of years, and there was a person in the room who just took Phil aside right there and said, Phil, I got to tell you that you know Genesis is my favorite band of all. And Phil's sitting there going, I don't want to hear this. Mm. We got work to do. Uh, why are you telling me this? And it, he wasn't wrong. He was not wrong. It's like if you're in the situation with the person, we're just buddies. Yeah. Save it for later. It's easier for them if you present yourself as an equal and easier for you too. The first time I worked with Phil, I walked in and he was tuning his drums. And it was that sound <laughs> on In the Air Tonight. He's going, yeah. doom, 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 doom. And I'm going, that's the, it's the sound he makes. It's the only sound he makes. Yeah. He's there making that sound in front of me in the room. I could melt right now. Yeah. But yet when I worked with them, it was kind of like, hey, Phil, how are you? Yeah, I think we should be, you know, it, save that stuff for yourself, you know, and your friends later and yeah. stories that you tell 20 years later. Tim, thanks for having me, man. Thanks for having me. So uh, I will have all of Tim's stuff linked down below his channel. If you don't already subscribe to Tim Pierce, you absolutely should be. He's a big reason why I started making YouTube videos six or seven years ago. And you're a big reason why I make YouTube videos today. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, it's, that, uh, that's an honor. Yeah, don't forget to like and subscribe. Appreciate you guys watching. My name is Rhett Scholl. That's Tim Pierce. We'll catch you on the next one.